On today's episode of my student pilot series, I will be taking you with me on my first cross-country flight from Pontiac to Bad Axe with my instructor in part five of five in my 21st lesson in the pursuit of my private pilot certification. You can experience the real conversation between me and my instructor using GPS tracking, heading back to Pontiac in under 20 minutes. Be sure to stick around until the end of the video for my top five tips and tricks. Welcome to my student pilot series. This is Janice Lynn and I'm excited today to take you with me on my first cross country flight in part five of five of my 21st lesson. If you've thought about becoming a private pilot but either haven't had the confidence to do it or lack the physical ability, I invite you to come along with me. If you enjoy this video, be sure to like, subscribe, and check the notification bell to let me know so I will continue to take you along with me on my training. Are you ready? Let's go. We have a message, it's probably a fuel tank again. I'll check it up. But I want to get back on course. Okay, very good. <laughs> okay, so fuel pump on, our fuel pressure looks good. Turn it back to you, our fuel pressure looks good. Fuel pump off, message off. 204, 205. So reset that heading bug. Not too bad if it's really an hour and 13 minutes. Well, from my miscalculations. <laughs> so, so you could see the error there, right? We said, yeah. oh, cow, what, well, how come yep. all these numbers were all the same? So when you were well, I did gut check it as far as the time was so drastic, but the wind was a lot different. I remember when we when we did our first practice flight, I used a wind aloft that was pretty high like that too. Today it actually happened. Sometimes the winds aloft up here are 10 or 15 knots. So what I usually do now is use kind of this as an opportunity to talk about like our garment panel up there, some of the features of this. So we're kind of just sitting here idly. So you're familiar with COM1 and COM2. Yeah. So if you push just the top one up here, you know this is listen only. So we wanted to listen, to, we wanted to stay communicating right here and listen to this. Dew point minus one. So we're still communicating two, right niner, here. Niner, but two. now we're just listening Attention to this airmen, one. Please use caution. Okay. So it's listen only. So this That's one is this one is this is mic and listen. This is just listen only. Now we talked about tuning and identifying on the other side. Yeah. And since we're kinda of slow today coming back, we're not gonna fly to the door. But that's how you navigate that's how you tune and identify. The DME and ADF buttons aren't gonna be used by you. Now we have right here this COM 1-2 or 1 slash 2. So what this actually does is if I push this button right here, if I push this button right here, COM 1 is on this headset or this side, COM 2 is over here. Oh. So right now I have you tuned in the bad X right here. Huh. Here's DCT practice area. Yeah. So you're hearing what's going on here. I'm listening to what's going on here. And if I wanted to talk to DCT, I could push this button right now. Okay. Talk to DCT or whoever is over here, and, and you won't you won't hear me communicating with these guys. Huh. So when I push this button to talk, it cuts me out of your headset. But you may see sometimes we're going back to Pontiac, and I'll uh, I'll tune that in. I'll push this button, and you'll see me talking. You don't hear anything. That's because I'm switching, I'm over here and making a communication with somebody else. So when we're on the same communication, when you push the button and you're talking, if I talk, do they hear me too? No, you gotta push your mic button. Okay. Now the speaker button right here, what the speaker button does, is actually just puts it all, there's a speaker right above our head up here. Okay. So it puts it out, this speaker right here, 
There used to be like backup microphones down here that you could like walkie talkie like CBs that you could communicate with. The speaker puts it out right there. PA, PA doesn't work on these. PA, if this was like a big airplane and we wanted to make a, like an announcement oh, okay. on an airliner, the pilot would push PA and they tell you whatever information. So the only other two important ones are pilot and crew right here. So if you're flying this airplane and you got a couple people in the airplane that keep talking and you're trying to make communications and you want to just shut them right out, push pilot right here and that cuts all the headsets and this airplane out of your feed right here. So this will make it so you can only hear. So if I push this right now, you won't even be able to hear me. Oh, okay. Crew, if we push crew, crew will be only me and you are talking and can hear each other. The people in the back seat wouldn't be able to hear us and I wouldn't be able to hear them. Okay. Okay, so I see all the other airplanes yeah, now because of yours. Sure. Now, if you zoom in... Okay, so oh, plus... Oh, you see three, their tail number. Plus 348. Most of them you see the tail number, like this one up here. Oh, but you see their SKW direction. SKW is SkyWest. CMB, I don't know who CMB is. If you touch on it, you'll see who they are. U.S. Transport Commander. So listen, it looks something military. Huh. So they're flying, they're flying uh, speed at 396 knots. Oh, they're going really fast. Yeah, so they're cruising. And if you look at that plus 348, is there 34,800 feet above us? Oh, that's their, oh, okay, that's, that's their not their direction. Nope, see this one that says minus one? Oh, they're, they're 100 really close. feet below us. Notice that's one's 5337 Foxtrot, that's one of our company airplanes. Right. So a lot of times that's why I was like, we're just, when we were just heading here, it was like, ah, we're close to the proving grounds. I saw 37 Foxtrot was real close to us, so I made a call real quick. We can see all DC team airplanes can, will be identified. Some people choose when they put it in to not have their tail number on there, so you won't see any tail number on it. You'll just see an arrow. When they put what in? So when they register their aircraft and they get the ADSB. So what we're doing is we're picking up an ADSB signal. So this little oh, thing okay. right here. There's the warning light for it, and ADSB is a automated dependent surveillance broadcast is what it is. All it is is essentially a transponder that sends out a signal that tells you your altitude, your direction, and your okay. speed. So is this our total flight time? That's the time since I touched it last, so that was the time probably from Marlette to okay. till here. What's the flashing R? Uh, somebody is, the uh, radar is receiving it. So somewhere along okay. the line, the radar is picking us so up. So we didn't do the flight plan. The flight following? Yeah. No, I didn't do it on this one. We'll do it when we go to Lansing. Okay. We had enough to do right now, working on some of this, so I just opted not to do the flight following. Okay, but you said when I do the solo, I would do that. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, we could use, we could get flight following simply, you know, from Pontiac to, like, Owl or something. We can use it anywhere we want. It doesn't always have to be long cross country. So this line with the hash marks, yes. I, what was that? So oh, we'll sc scroll out a little bit. See a name on it? Steelhead MOA. Yeah, I remember what MOAs took for. Is that a military operation area? It sure is. Can we fly in it? It's not restricted, so I, well, we're in it, so yeah. Yeah, we're, we're, we're really not actually in it. If it's a magenta sh uh, shaded, like, uh, fence post kind of line right there, you can fly in it without permission. If it's blue, it's going to be restricted or prohibited. On fourth flight, if you want to see more information about it, touch on one of those lines for the MOA. Touch it and hold it. So see steelhead, hit the details. Oh, it highlighted yep. that. So hit details. There you go. 
So steelhead, upper limit 17, 6,000. Oh, so we're not even near that. Nope. Okay, so... Now, if you want to find out information about Marlette, touch Marlette's airport. So you have to touch it and hold it. Now, Marlette Township right there, hit more. That's not the airport, though. Oh, you got it, head. So, Marlette Township, just hit more. Hit details. There's the airport. Information right there. You want weather, touch the weather. You want the runway diagram, touch the runway. Boom, right there. You want their diagram? Touch that diagram. Now you put that 70, so touch yeah, flight, touch right. flight plan. I think I put it in. Touch 77 golf, just pull it out of there. There you go. All right, so we're tracking back. It's still 53 miles to Pontiac. How far off of our course are we? Which direction is our course that we established, and how far off are you? Oh, it's because it's broken? So our course, remember we talked, we were using the CDI needle, right? So the CDI needle right now, and if we come up here, we can look the same thing. Remember, the triangle is us. Okay. Our course that we established is this line. So the course that we established is actually over there. It's off to our left. Yeah. The XTK tells us how far we're off the course. Oh, okay. 0.3 nautical miles. 0.3 nautical miles. Now, with the Garmin, that dashed line right there, that you see that dashed line? Yeah. Is actually showing us the track that we're flying across the ground. Yeah. So it's, it's showing us our ground track that we're currently flying. So do you want me to get back on track? Yeah, so we'll... We'll intercept just like you got it right now. So see how the dashed line on this one is intercepting the top of that CDI? Oh, okay. That's a perfect intercept to get us right back on track. Because our ground now showing us our ground track is tracking us towards that course where we wanted to go. And the arrow is coming closer. Yep, and that line is starting to come in. You can see our number is getting smaller. This line is coming in right here. Do we have this on the Warriors? Um, he's putting them on the Warriors. Because I know we don't have that. Nope. And remember, most of those Warriors are just the old school directional gyro that you got to reset about every 20 minutes. He's installing so, these. So on the Warrior, well, we have that, right? You sure do. So this is the Omni Bearing Selector. That's what they call this. You have that movable car. This is what we use to track that VOR. Right. The CDI is what they call the needle, the course deviation indicator, so it's letting you know how much we're off of our course. And you know, the truth is, is if you're within 0.5 nautical miles of a course, you're tracking your GPS, you're close enough, because what we're doing is we're using this GPS to get us towards that airport, and then once we see the airport, we're going to fly in visually from there. Actually, the turbulence, the turbulence uh, air vent here is effective, right? Yeah, surface is 7,000. Low level wind shear. It really is only bumpy, like up to about 1,000 feet today. Besides those few bumps, uh, those couple gusts we got leaving Pontiac, it wasn't that bad. So but, when they say low level wind shear, that's under a thousand? Yeah, so that's close to the ground. So we talk about wind shear, remember what the definition of the wind shear is? Um, it's wind coming from any direction. 
So it's a sudden change in wind speed and or direction. So we can have winds coming from in front of us to switching behind us. So we can have them speeding up, them slowing down. They can be vertical, it can be horizontal. So they can push us to the ground, they can pick us up. So when we departed Pontiac, we kind of caught a little bit of both. Just I, I was watching the windsock, it was kind of moving around like that, and then as soon as we kind of started that turn, boy, it sure felt like we got like a little bit of an updraft right there, and downdraft. Why can it be dangerous? Because if you're flying, so let's say we're going into Pontiac, and we're flying right into runway 27, the wind's coming directly at you. So the wind's coming directly at you, and it's 10 knots, it's gusting to 20. So that means 10 knots is pretty consistent, but it's getting additions of wind 10 knots here or there with those gusts. So if we're headed right in towards that wind and we're at 65 knots and all of a sudden that 20 knot gust disappears, what happens to your airspeed? It increases. Your airspeed actually decreases. But you're flying into the wind. You are flying so into the, the wind. wind falls away and then what's your speed? So your airspeed decreases because the airspeed, all that airspeed is measuring is how fast air is moving over the wings. So if all of a sudden okay, that wind... Ground speed, is your ground speed increase? So ground speed is just measuring how fast uh, our ground speed, so our ground speed, yeah, in that situation probably would increase. Right, okay. So in my, my example, so if, if you get that wind that's coming at you disappears, your speed is going to drop. If it shears from a headwind to a tailwind, that tailwind's not going to instantly push you. That wind that's coming at you disappears. Whatever amount that wind was from your airspeed indicator is going to disappear too. Because that gust isn't blowing. So if we're sitting on the ground with a 50 knot wind, your airspeed is going to show 50 knots, even though we're not even off the ground. Because it's just measuring how much air is flowing over our wings. Yeah, because our airspeed's really high right now, but our ground speed yeah. is really low. So there's a perfect example right now. So they said winds were 40 knots right now, or 50 knots. So I kind of make a difference. So we have a, what, 120? Yeah. We have 59 knots. So that means right now we're headed into a wind that's about 60 knots. So if that wind, all of a sudden that 60 knots goes away, you're gonna see this drop all the way to 60 knots. Does that make sense? Because now we don't have that extra wind blowing over our wings. So that's why when you have gusty conditions or wind shear, you'll bring extra speed in on your final approach. So when I said, hey, let's fly that approach in about 75 knots today. So we came in about 80, slowing down to 75, because if those gusts disappeared, I didn't want their airspeed to drop way down. I mean, look at our, so we're probably 62. I mean, we're almost into the yellow line right here, but our ground speed is 60 to 61 yeah. knots. So what do you do if the wind pushes your airspeed up really? Into the yellow right now? Well, I mean, what if you go up closer to the... Bring this power back. Okay. Yep, because while we're cruising, when we're cruising uh, at level flight, the power controls our speed, and the pitch controls our altitude. So in slow flight, what you were learning in slow flight, he, David may have taught you uh, or said the term that it's uh, the region of reverse command, or you're on the backside of the power curve, no? So in, if you read in the books, they talk about the region of reverse command, and what they mean by that is that in cruise flight, we use our throttle for our speed. We use our pitch for our altitude. But in slow flight, it's exactly the opposite. You use the power for your altitude and you use the pitch for your airspeed. Therefore, it's reversed from what it would normally be. So you're pretty much right back on course right now. Yeah. So if you're in the navigation page, we could use the little knob to go through each page in this chapter. 
Here's a map. You can change the scale of that map by changing the range right here. So you can zoom in and zoom out. It does show us some of the airspace here. So there's airspace coming ahead of us. Shows us our relationship to that course. We're going to Pontiac. So did we talk about the frequencies loading these in the other day? No? Okay. So like, Pontiac. Oh, you can like push it, right? And it'll... Yeah, so if we wanted to, you know, like, if we wanted to, say, put ground in there, we'd highlight this cursor. We can take this down to here. Ground, you push enter, and it'll put it up in the standby for you. Didn't know one of the frequencies. That's a way to get information. It gives us a compass page right here. This is where we're at, latitude and longitude. But this is showing you how many satellites are out there that are available for us to pick up. So, how come this one is showing me tracking at like 200? But this one. So, all you're like worried 220. about. 220. Yeah, so, well, because here's why. So, 203, you set that heading bug. Because right now, we're headed 220. So, what we're doing is that we're compensating for the wind. So we've corrected, so you figured out on that piece of paper with the direction of the wind, how much we needed to go plus or minus yeah. from our heading. So what we're doing right now is we're essentially flying the, we're flying a straight line over the ground, but the airplane is sideways faced into the wind, so we're not drifting off that course. Please excuse my technical difficulties. You'll just have to believe the rest of the flight was pretty boring anyways. Now for my top five tips and tricks. Number one, GPS flying is boring, but it's a great backup too. Although it's more pre-work, pilotage is much more engaging. Three, check your technology along the way. Four, have fun. And five, make time to celebrate your accomplishments. Thanks for staying until the end. To continue with me on my pilot training, be sure to check out my Lesson 22 video.